This is episode number 19 of Hitting for the Cycle. I'm Ryan Tui, and I am joined today by Nick DiMartino. Nick, how are you doing? All right, how are you? I'm doing very good. Um, the winter meetings obviously picked up yesterday in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. A lot of moves happened, and we got a lot to discuss today. But before we do, I just want to remind um, to follow our social media, follow us on Facebook, X, and Instagram at HFTCETB. Follow the Empty the Bench podcast network on Facebook, X, and Instagram at ETB Network. Follow our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash ETB Network. And finally, follow our website, etppodcast.com. So yeah, like I said, winter meetings. Yesterday was quite an eventful day. And you know, there's an elephant in the room, and let's get right to it. The uh, New York Yankees and the San Diego Padres pulled off a massive, massive trade yesterday. And there it is. Padres have traded Juan Soto to the Yankees. In exchange, the Yankees send over Kyle Agashioka, their longtime catcher. Michael King, who's the big um, component uh, on the Yankees' side. The Yankees also send over um, pitching prospect Drew Thorpe and pitchers Johnny Brito and Randy Vasquez. And the Padres also send along Trent Grisham along with uh, Juan Soto to the Yankees. So, Nick, um, I'll let the let you have the floor. What do you think of the deal? Well, it, I mean, first of all, I, I think that it really depends on what, what ends up happening. I mean, like, getting another big bat like Soto, I think, is very important for the Yankees. But uh, ultimately, it really just depends on whether or not they – you have to remember, Soto has one year left on his contract. It's worth it if they can re-sign him long term. It's not worth it at all if they don't. If he's only if they rent him for a season, um, and that's really where all the risk lies. Ultimately, I think it would be a good trade for the Yankees, but we just don't know yet because there's a lot of risk involved. Yeah, I agree, and I mean, obviously, the Yankee offense was awful this past season they ranked in the bottom of the american league in basically all offensive categories and a major complaint that the yankees fans had and a lot of people had when it came to the yankees was how heavy how heavily right-handed they were they really had no legitimate left-handed bats for a majority of the season i mean anthony rizzo got off to a solid start but then he got concussed um after fernando tatis jr ran into his head so, you know, they went through a majority of the season with l- really no legitimate left-handed power bat or left-handed bat in general. And you're playing in a stadium that is built for left-handed hitters with that 314 porch down the right field line. Yankee Stadium has always been, you know, notorious for helping left-handed hitters out. And the Yankees just did not have that. And that, that's kind of inexcusable. They had no um, balance in that lineup. It was eight righties and one lefty. You know, some nights it was um, Billy McKinney, other nights it was Jake Bowers, some nights it was Ben Rordfed, but they just did not have any big left-handed bats. So, you know, this is a major gamble, obviously, but you know what? It's one that I think as a Yankee fan needed to be done. I mean, obviously, this is it, Soto only has one year left of his contract, like you mentioned, but Soto is one of the best players in baseball. He's top five easily, if not top three um best baseball players in the game currently you know he manufactures his at-bats he works to count he gets on base a lot he doesn't strike out too much he is um he puts the bat on the ball and he's also able to spray the ball to all fields he's not just um strictly right field he can also go to left and uh, left center and yeah the Yankees like I said they needed a big splash after um, going just 82 and 80, which for Yankee fans is unacceptable. And for the Yankees themselves is unacceptable. So, you know, to me, you know, the Yankees are taking a risk here. I personally am for it. And we'll see if the Yankees are able to extend Juan Soto after the season. It's going to be tough. Soto's a Scott Boris client and Scott Boris, you know, you'll, you know, he loves his clients to test the free agent markets and get the biggest contract offer imaginable. And Soto is not going to come cheap after 2024, so. No, you're right about that. But if anybody can pay it, it's the Yankees. Absolutely. I mean, you always hear, oh, they buy championships. Like, so it's not like the Yankees couldn't do it. Um, The interesting thing would be if he has a bad year. And that that would be the interesting thing would be if he has a bad year. What, What did the Yankees do then? Let's say he hits, like, under 250. 
30 home runs, maybe like, you know, whatever. That's not terrible, but, you know, not as good as they would expect him to be. Uh, what do they do then? Um, you know, that's a pretty reasonable question. And it's not like it's unheard of for players to get signed and not meet up there and not reach expectations. Um, overall, I would say it's not a bad deal. It's not a bad deal. It's understandable. And they had to make some type of change. I mean, the Yankee season last year was unacceptable. Uh, they, they weren't good. Uh, and you have to make changes. Um, I guess with that, it comes some risk. Um, and, you know, maybe in hindsight, a year from now, we're going to say it was a terrible deal. But they, they had to do something and to get another bat in the lineup. Um, it, I mean, you, they might have to do more than than just this, and they're, they're in a tough division. Um, but they had to do something about this. I mean, it, you, you, like, fans all, also expect results. Um, the Yankees have the money to re-sign him, and they have, still have a bunch of good players. It's not like it's going to be impossible to get one of the best players in baseball to sign with the Yankees. Like, like they, 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 it, like it's a risk, but it's something that the Yankees can at least live up to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but yeah, you make you make a good point. I mean, you hope that Soto is worth it. I mean, last year, the Yankees' biggest offseason acquisition was Carlos Rodon, and he had an absolutely disastrous uh, first season as a Yankee. He couldn't stay healthy, and when he was on the mound, he stunk. Now, Soto obviously is not a pitcher, and um, he has shown that he has a very good track record in the health department. But we'll see. I mean, I think Soto, personally, as a Yankee fan, I think Soto's going to have a good year. I think he's he's this is his contract year. He's playing for the biggest contract imaginable. I think he has a lot to prove for to himself and to um and to all of baseball that he is one of the best baseball players out there. And I think he's going to play with some motivation and fire. He has stated that he really likes playing at Yankee Stadium, and I think he's going to benefit from playing here. I I, I think Soto is going to have a good year. I personally think he will, but you never know. Um, I just think that when it comes to somebody of his caliber, you know, fans expect him to never struggle. Um, that is not always, that's not the case. There are going to be times I'm sure where he is going to struggle, like basically everybody else. But like you said, it is, it's not a bad deal. It's something that needed, the Yankees had to do something. They could not run the same lineup out here again for another year. It was not working. You had to do something. And Soto's only 25 years old. He's gonna be he's gonna be 25 all of next season. He just turned 25. So there's definitely more yeah, upside to this than than downside to this. And I think this is definitely um, a good it's a good it's a good risk that the Yankees are taking. And also the Yankees brought in um, Trent Grisham. He's also a part of this deal. Grisham's a very good outfielder. He's not a good hitter. Um, he doesn't really hit much at all. But he'll most likely be a fourth outfielder scenario and like i said the yankees the biggest thing that they had to give up for juan soto was losing michael king um who was projected to be one of the um maybe projected to be number a number two or three starter in that rotation behind uh, garrett cole so you know they're gonna lose some depth in that rotation um and yeah it's um it, it's a it was a risk that they had to take and um the day prior to this the Yankees also made a very rare deal with their arch rival Boston Red Sox. They also brought in Alex Verdugo. And many people thought that when they did this, they were looking to just keep Verdugo on just so that they can use him as part of the deal to get Soto. So, but Verdugo looks like he's here to stay um, for uh, 2024. He's going to have to shave off that scruff. And it's another left-handed outfield to bat that the Yankees are going to have. Um, so Verdugo's a solid, scrappy ball player. He's a, he's not a big power threat. He'll he'll hit line drives all over the field. And um, you know, with this deal, I think it was I kind of like it honestly. I think the more outfield, the more left-handed um, and outfield depth that you have in your ros on your roster, I think the better. For too long, the Yankees have been bringing in just these r random guys like Jake Bowers, Willie McKinney, um, Marwin Gonzalez, Rugnet Odor. These, those guys aren't going to move the needle. 
Verdugo definitely made a name for himself with the Red Sox. Um, there has he did get into controversy a few times here and there when he was with Boston. There were problems I think that Alex Cora had with his attitude. Sometimes he wouldn't run all the way down to first base at 100, percent and the Red Sox took exception to that. But um, the Yankees sent three pitchers to the Red Sox in exchange for Verdugo. And yeah, uh, what do you think of this deal? Um, it's all right. Um, I guess they didn't really give up that much. My only concern might be like, how much are they depleting their pitching for the future? Um, and Alex Verdugo is just like an okay player. Uh, I mean, he's good, obviously. He's no Juan Soto. Um, I mean, I, I guess I can see, uh, look, the Yankees are just trying to make as many moves as possible to make sure that they're not the same Yankees team that they were last year. I mean, all that being said, it's not like they gave up any star pitchers. <laughs> like, it's not like it, it's not like they gave up like a Garrett Cole or anything like that. Um, ultimately, it really just depends on how good these pitchers end up being, and they must not expect them to be that good uh, in the future. So, it, it's it's okay. It's an okay deal, I would say. I, I'd give it like a B. I'd give it a B. Um, I mean, it'll, it'll still be a solid addition to their out to. Uh, their lineup, uh, and that's something. That's not. That's not nothing. Um, but I don't. I don't know. I mean, I don't think it, it. It's not. It doesn't nearly have the impact to say like the Soto trade does. Um, and even if. And the truth is, even if Verdugo kind of flops, it's not really going to be as consequent. Like the fans won't be as mad about it as if Soto flops. Um, but it's just one of these things where it's like, I think the Yankees are just more primed to make more moves because of how bad they were last year. That's really what I think this is. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, Verdugo, like I said, he's a solid, like, like we said, he's a solid ball player. And the Yankees are going to be without Jason Dominguez for half of 2024. He's not expected to come back till around July of next year. So they're going to need some, they're going to need to fill some holes in the outfield and um, most likely it's, I think it's going to be judge in center field. I think judges, you're going to see judge a lot more in a center field than, um, than anywhere else. Um, and I think um, they're going to put Verdugo in right field and um, Soto on the left. I could be wrong, but I think that's the way that they will uh, structure their outfield um, come opening day. But Verdugo is also in a contract year like Soto. Um, so, I mean, if the Yankees are going to be looking to extend Soto after this year, this could be the only year Verdugo plays with the Yankees. But um, I do think that he is better than what the Yankees have had in previous years. Um, you know, like you said, the Yankees are really clearing out their um, their pitching to get some of these offensive uh, ball players. They they needed to get better on offense. The, their offense was just so bad in the last year that well, that's, that's exactly why they did it. Yeah, so you know, I I understand why they did it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not often that the Yankees and the Red Sox do business with each other. I think this was only the eighth time since like 1968 or 69 that they've um that they've made a move. The last move that I can remember these two teams doing was um was Adam Ottavino uh, going over to uh, Boston a couple of years ago. Um, that's the last one that I can remember, but. I definitely think this helps the Yankees out with their depth um, in the outfield. Um, and like I said, Verdugo is also another left-handed bat. The Yankees obviously need to um, get at least – the Yankees definitely have at least balanced out their lineup a little bit more with some left-handers. I think this makes it like five righties, four lefties. So they definitely have – they're definitely addressing the elephant in the room. And um, I definitely think that this is a good move, I think. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, well, I'll, I'll have to say, I mean, like – Unlike the Soto trade, it's like the, the Yankees are like, okay, we if we sign him for seven more years, if we end up re-signing him, that's going to be a good move. And and you have Soto long term. It's, I mean, they can. This could be a one and done year for Verdugo, and Yankee fans would generally be fine with it. Yeah, like, I think that's I don't uh, like. Sure, he's a solid addition for now. It, it, like this is a very, in my view, this is a very low risk trade. I mean, the worst case scenario is Verdugo stinks with the Yankees and he's not – and they don't re-sign him. For the Yankees, that's the worst case scenario. If anything, Verdugo 
it, the stakes are higher for Verdugo because it's a contract year, and it's it's much more important to him that he that he has a good season than it is for the Yankees of anything. Um, it, it like this trade is not very high stakes, and it's relatively it's a relatively smart move. Um, not, not just from a baseball standpoint, but from a PR standpoint. So Brian Cashman can said he did, he's done something and I, I'm a Met fan. I'm not a Yankee fan. So I, I, if anything, I root against the Yankees. Um, so I don't really have any reason to care about the Yankees, uh, future. Um, but you know, Yankee fans are very hard on Cashman. Um, he's been there a very, very, he's been there for like what, 20 years now, more than that. Five. 25 years. Okay. I mean, how many GMs last for 25 years? A lot of my friends are Yankee fans. A lot of them hate Cashman. <laughs> um, Cashman's a very good GM. It's given that I'm a Met fan and, you know, we've gone through our fair share of really bad GMs. <laughs> uh, and, you, you know, he really just – Cashman, every year, especially after going 82 and 80, he has to make a bunch of moves. He has to make a bunch of moves. Otherwise – Yankee fans call for his head. Well, the Yankees basically, the Yankee fans basically call for his head every single season. Yeah. Um, especially since they haven't won a World Series since 2009. And Yankee fans are more are getting more and more impatient um, with this payroll and the amount of talent that they have on this team, especially since you have Judge and Cole who, who are coming off back-to-back historic seasons and they've got nothing to show for it. You know, they, Yankee fan, the Yankees don't want to waste these guys' uh, primes. You know, Judge is going to be 32 next season. Cole is going to be 33 or 34 next year. So they're not getting any younger. Um, you don't know how, how much longer they can keep up this level of dominance in their careers. I mean, Yankees still have a lot of years with Judge because they signed us to that humongous contract last offseason. So, you but, know. But the thing is, with these contracts, it's usually worth it. I mean, if you don't sign a bunch of really – if you don't sign a bunch of bats, especially in a strong division like the AL East, you really have no chance. I, I mean, in baseball, signing, I mean, signing really signing really solid hitters, guys that can hit 250 or more, 30, 40 home runs a year, it's almost like quarterbacks in the NFL, except you need a bunch of them. Um, that's the difference. I mean, quarterbacks in the, in the NFL, it's more about the quarterbacks individually. Uh, in baseball, it's ba- it's about getting a whole bunch of them, which is why they can get such big contracts. And the truth is, the risk in baseball is so much higher uh, because in football, you can like for instance, you can generally pre- and same thing with basketball. You can generally predict how good a player is going to be. Like you can more or less predict how good a quarterback is going to be, how good a basketball player is going to be. Like. It's not difficult to predict that James Harden, for instance, is going to be a good player, but going to be a huge distraction, go to strip clubs, all that. Uh, in football, it's not difficult to, unless a, unless a quarterback is aging, to know how like how good a quarterback is going to be, more or less. In baseball, it's very hard to predict how good a hitter is going to be. Is he going to hit 250? Is he going to hit 200? Is he going to hit 300? You don't know. It is much higher risk. Every single one of these moves are higher risk in baseball, partly because you need so many of them, whereas it's it's not just about one guy. Um, I mean, luckily for the Yankees, they already have a bunch of really good players. But like these moves in baseball, it's impossible to really – it's impossible for any GM to really know what's going to happen. I mean, some players get to New York and they just stink in New York. Like you just don't know sometimes. Um, and even sometimes it's not about the move. Sometimes like Alonzo had an amazing first half of the season last year. He got hurt. And after that, he stunk. Um, sometimes players can hit a whole bunch of home runs and their batting average is terrible. Uh, you, you, it's so hard in baseball. It's so hard to be a GM. I think being a GM in baseball is harder than in any other sport, honestly, yeah, especially would... for a team like the Yankees. <laughs> I mean, being a general manager is definitely a thankless job, and you can only do so much to try and improve your team. Especially and- when it's for Yankee fans, who are who tend to be a, a thankless fan base, not a very thankful fan base. I try to be thankful for a lot <laughs> of things, but um, understandably so. You've had a lot of success. I'm not. I'm not saying that as a bashing of Yankee fans. I'm just no. saying, and to be fair, Met fans are not very thankful either. Um, but because the Yankees are used to so much success and they're in New York, 
um, that fan base tends to be less thankful than other fan bases. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like like we said, um, I mean, George Steinbrenner, you know, when he was the principal owner for the Yankees, he always went out year after year to try and get the biggest free agent imaginable. And, you know, fans were called – are Yankee fans too often compare his son – to um to George Steinbrenner when he's not you know I think you know as much as you know sometimes Cashman and um how can drive me crazy personally as a Yankee fan um at the same time you got to stop comparing eras and you got to stop comparing personalities they are not George Steinbrenner they never have been George they, they never will be George Steinbrenner nobody can in my opinion and that can be a good thing I think you should just be your own person so yeah. but yeah I mean the Yankees are definitely, you know, making moves this off season and they're going to try and keep making more moves because right now they are in a kind of a battle with the Mets to try and land a Japanese pitching phenom, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Now the Mets, Steve Cohen himself, I believe, um, flew to Japan to personally meet with Yamamoto just a little while ago to try and entice him to sign with the Mets. And on Monday, Yamamoto's coming to the U.S. to meet with the Yankees. And both of these teams obviously need starting pitching. Um, obviously, with the Yankees losing Michael King in the Soto deal, their rotation is definitely thinned out more. And with the Mets, they obviously need to improve that rotation as well. I mean, the, the Mets did sign Luis Severino to that one-year deal, but Severino yeah. obviously has I not. I like that move. Yeah, even though Severino hasn't been the same pitcher in recent he's injured years. injured a lot. And he's been injured way too much, so you don't really know what you're going to get with him. Um so, yeah, both teams could use Yamamoto. I mean, Yamamoto obviously has been described as the best pitcher to ever come out of Japan. Um, so, you know, it's a dogfight, basically. Um, Steve Cohen, I mean, you know how much he's willing to spend in order to improve the team. We well, were saying, like, the best pitcher in Japanese history to go to the MLB. I see yes, what that's, what okay. I mean. that's, what, that's what I meant. Yeah, I that, was that's, confused what, for a second. <laughs> that's, no, that, that's what the media has described him as. So I couldn't, I don't know. I don't, I've never watched Japanese baseball before. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> well, you know, from what I've seen, I mean, he, he pitched in the uh, WBC earlier this year um, and he pit and he pitched pretty good. Um, and he had another, and he had a phenomenal season this year. Um, Brian Cashman attended one of his games. He attended the game where he threw a no hitter as a matter of fact. And um, yeah, I mean, Yamamoto is obviously one of the most sought after free agents this off season. So I guess I'll I'll leave I'll leave the floor to you. Um, wh where do you see um, Yamamoto ending up? I don't know. I hope he ends up with the Mets. What else? I think that my question. I, I have no idea, to be honest with you, who is more likely to land him. I think part of the reason. I think both teams think they likely will. Um, I mean, I think part of the reason the Yankees felt totally okay with trading away Michael King was because they thought they might get Yamamoto. Um. I, I but ultimately we don't know how good he's going to be in uh, the MLB. I mean, we thought Kaz Matsui was going to be amazing in the MLB because he was a great player in Japan. You just don't know what's going to happen sometimes. Um, but overall, I would say both teams at least are confident enough that they might go that um, that they might go to each. I mean, I think he'll either go to the Mets or the Yankees. I think. Um, but I, I think the Yankees are at least confident that he can go there because that's why they felt comfortable. Like, otherwise, they wouldn't have traded away one of their best pitchers, or at least they'd feel less comfortable doing it. Um, although they're kind of putting all their eggs in one basket, it might it like, but you know, e either way, I my question, my what I wonder is how much of a difference does it make that Steve Cohen flew to Japan? to see Yamamoto as opposed to him going to the States to meet with the Yankees. I mean, that's a long flight and I, I'm kind of kidding, but I'm not like, I don't know how much of a difference that makes from his perspective as like the, the owner of the Mets going to him as opposed to the owner of the Yankee, as opposed to like going all the way to the States to meet the owner of the Yankees. I also haven't seen these interactions um, baseball does not have a salary cap, so you don't have to worry about cap room or anything like that. It's not like a football or basketball type of signing. Um, I don't know. 
I don't know. But if I were to make a guess, I would say he's going to go to the Yankees. I don't think – I think that if there's – if the Mets and Yankees are boxing each other out, the Yankees are more likely to win that. And second of all, something tells me that Steve Cohen thinks that too because he flew to Japan. I mean, flying to Japan – to meet him sound seems to me a little bit like a desperation move, possibly either a desperation move or an attempt to say at the best case scenario, an attempt to really try and stand out. But to me, it seems a little bit like a desperation move because getting on a plane to go to Japan seems like a lot, even if you're Steve Cohen. Um, so something tells me Steve Cohen also thinks that, um, but I, th- I say he's going to go to the Yankees. Probably. I just don't, I-, I think it's more likely he'll go to the Yankees. Oh, I understand where you're uh, where you're coming from. I mean, I think that Cohen, you know, is showing that he is sincere and he is serious, obviously, about signing Yamamoto. And I, and he's trying to appease him and saying, you know, hey, I flew all this way to let you know that I'm dead serious about signing you. So I think Yamamoto will appreciate the gesture regardless. But, um, I mean, he is obviously going to the uh, U.S. next week and, you know, meeting up with uh, Cashman and the Yankees. Yamamoto has stated that the uh, lore and the history of the Yankees has um, appealed to him. And obviously the Yankees have had plenty of uh, Japanese players come into their organization and have success. Obviously Hideki Matsui, um, who led them to their last world championship. The Yankees obviously um, had Masahiro Tanaka for a couple of years, who had a very good, respectable career with the Yankees. So Uh, only for a short period of time. Yeah, but he definitely um, he definitely held his uh, his end of the bargain. He was a very good postseason pitcher, yeah. especially more than anything else. So I think Yamamoto is – and Yamamoto, like I said, Yamamoto himself stated that, you know, he is intrigued by the history and um, everything that the Yankees represent. So I definitely agree with you that he is going to end up with one of these two teams. Um, it really just depends on, you know, what he prefers, who um, who gets to him more. I mean, obviously, likely the, who offers him more money? Yeah, more than anything else. I mean, I, but also, you know, some of the offseason moves. You know, you know, the Yankees have made, have been making all these moves. You know, they're starting to reconstruct their team and showing that they are all in for uh, 2024. So, if uh, Yamamoto really wants to have a legitimate shot at, um, you know, winning the World Series, if he's really um, enticed by all these moves that the Yankees made. He may be inclined to sign with the Yankees more than the Mets. The Mets, I think, need to make a few more moves this offseason. I think they need to improve that lineup, too. Um, So it really just depends on what Yamamoto wants, what he thinks he's going to be most comfortable with. I mean, obviously, the spotlight will be on him in a big media market like New York. No matter what, no matter which team he goes to. No, yeah, absolutely. And um, but I think he'll thrive under that. He seems like a guy who wants the attention, who likes the um, who likes the big stage. Well, maybe not like the attention, like, you know, constantly like being monitored, but like likes the attention of, you know, being focused in a big game. That's what I, I think. Mean. I think if anything seems like more like not so much that he likes the attention, but can handle the attention. And it's okay That's probably it. a better way to describe it. Um, it. Well, I think a lot of I mean, I don't know much about how. What I can tell you is the Yankees are much more of a global brand than the Mets. Um, And it is, I mean, I don't know how popular the Yankees are in Japan. I couldn't answer that question for you. I'm sure they're much more popular than the Mets. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I know baseball is relatively popular in Japan. I assume they get MLB games. um, Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they, they yeah they do. I mean, Japan. I mean, baseball is humongously popular in Japan, and yeah. um, I mean, especially with Otani being the face of Major League Baseball here. You know, fans are always tuning into. Um, I th- I think they do Angel simulcast games. Um, in Japan, I'm sh- I'm sure they um, they definitely air um Major League games in Japan, especially yeah. for their heroes. I, I wouldn't be surprised if in Japan there's a lot of Angels fans and Mariners fans. Um, yeah, there, there definitely are. And um, and possibly even some Yankee fans because they've had a lot of they've had quite a few really uh, they've had quite a few star Japanese players. I can tell you there are no Met there probably aren't many Met fans in Japan. <laughs> That's there's probably a lot uh, there's probably not nearly as many Met fans in Japan. The the, the Mets had Kaz Matsui, Kaz Ishii, uh, like all the jet ja- um, Shinjo, like all the Japanese players that went to the Mets stunk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the Yankees are definitely. They're probably the biggest 
um, American baseball team name in Japan too. Um, I'm not saying that just because I'm a Yankee fan. I'm just like, no, no, that's objectively accurate. Yeah. yeah. And um, my question is, I don't know how much Yamamoto cares about that. That's the only thing. He might not care. I don't think so either. I just think that – I think Yamamoto just wants to pitch, and I think he wants to pitch in big games, and I think he wants to win. So I definitely yeah. think that both of these teams can um, appeal to him in that regard. Ultimately, <laughs> what we're both trying to do is superficially try and understand what he's thinking, and we just don't know. Like, it's just a reality. I mean, what I do know is that – Cashman and Cohen are both would both be very good at trying to lure him to their respective teams. Um, at, uh, kind of like college football recruiting in a sense. I, I think both of them can do a good job doing that. Um, but that's the, ex but you know, that's the extent of what I would know. Um, and you know, like I said, it's, you know, Steve Cohen, what he did seemed like an act of desperation a little bit. Like he flew to Japan to see Yamamoto. Like didn't, isn't he going here anyway? Yeah, he is come, like I said, he's coming here on Monday to meet with the Yankees personally. Right. So I think that he wanted to like <laughs> really, really show his dedication by flying to Japan. He wanted to get a head start in front of the Yankees because he knows the Yankees are a threat to sign him too. So, you know, he wants to he wants to get a little bit of a head start, you know, and try and get to Yamamoto a little earlier than the Yankees. And, I, yeah. And by the way, you're talking about how the Yankees, they need to get better and they need to make moves. I mean – Take that and multiply it by about 100, and that's what you have with the Mets. I mean, the Mets were like the biggest failure, the biggest disappointment in baseball last year. Uh, I mean, the Mets are – the only difference is our, the fan base is more used to losing and a little bit more beaten down. Uh, that's the only difference. But, I mean, if the Met, if the Yankees need to be better, so do – oh, my God, the Mets do – the, do the Mets need to be better? Uh, it's like – like Steve Cohen is in that position times 100 – uh, compared to uh, Brian Cashman. Well, especially with how much he spent last season and how last season turned out. So, yeah, I mean, the Mets definitely have their work cut out for them. They definitely need to make some big moves this soft season. They haven't really made any significant moves besides um, bringing in Severino for one year. But, like, but, like uh, I really like that move. I mean, I like that move because it's only one year. Severino's a solid pitcher. It's not a long-term thing. It can't hurt, really. No, you just hope that Severino doesn't get hurt again. He can't stay healthy. Yeah, that's the problem, but it's worth it. Yeah, I mean the fact that it's only one year and it's only thirteen million, it is it is worth it is worth the risk. I mean the Mets had to completely clear out their uh, starting rotation last year after the season just went down south. So yeah, I mean Severino will bring some experience. He's he's a solid pitcher. I still think he can. I still think he's got what it takes to compete. But you just hope that he's able to stay healthy because his body just keeps betraying him year after year after year. He hasn't had a full season pitching since 2018. He's had Tommy John surgery. He's had a bunch of arm injuries. Um, he's had a lot of lat, lat problems. His, he just Every year it's a lat injury. And he has had a hard time making the opening day roster healthy. So, you know, it's a gamble that the Mets are willing to take. But like you said, it's kind of low risk. So we'll see what happens. You know, I mean, I only wish the best for Severino. But, you know, you never know. And, um, you know, the Yankees obviously are looking to just add some depth behind um, Cole, especially since Rodon just had a horrible year this past season. You don't know what you're going to get out of him. Clark Schmidt, you know, he has been he was kind of up and down. But he def I think he did get better, though, as the season went along. He became a little more consistent. Nestor Cortez obviously um, was hurt a lot, and um, you know, you know, you don't really know what you're going to get out of him. So, you know, Yamamoto, you know, even though he was a phenomenal, he was a phenomenal pitcher in Japan. You don't know how exactly he'll fare in the United States. I think he, I personally, I think he'll have a good career in the United States um, based on some of the highlights that I saw and based on his demeanor. And the fact that he's only 25 years old, I think he's got some really good years um, in the tank with him when it comes to um, when he makes the transition to uh, Major League Baseball this season. So we'll see what happens. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the difference is I can't I don't know how much I can't imagine Japanese baseball is much different from Major League Baseball. It's not like football or basketball where there's very different schematics. And, you know, like you can look at a college quarter like, like all the time we hear. Well, he's a good college quarterback, but he won't be good in the NFL. Like you don't hear that with baseball as much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I but I ultimately I don't know because I've never watched Japanese baseball. But I, 
you know, if you're a good pitcher in Japan, you can be a good pitcher in the MLB. In the MLB, the only difference is the competition is tougher, but it's the same thing basically. Yeah. Um, uh, also, the thing with Severino is, you know, he is only 29. It feels like he's been in the league forever. It feels like he's a lot older than. 29. Well, he made his debut in 2015. He was only 21 when he made his debut. Yeah, it feels like he's been around a lot longer. Um, especially, it feels like he's a lot older, partly because he's always injured. Um, that's part of the reason I like the Severino signing. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that ultimately, we don't know how good any of them are going to be. But the point is, is that if you're Steve Cohen, if you're Brian Cashman, no matter what, you have to make a bunch of moves. That's really the point. And, and the point and the problem with the Mets is not that last year, it's not that they made, it's not that they took too many risks. It's that they took too many risks on really old players. Um, but the answer is to still take risks. And, you know, I don't know. I'd rather my GM make risks, uh, take risks and fail sometimes than do what the old Mets strategy was, like what the Wilpons did, which was not make moves and be satisfied with worse than mediocrity. Um, so, you know, it's always a risk, no matter what. And for the Yankees, they're taking a pretty big risk. Um, but, you know, you just have to do it. That's really all it is. You have to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and speaking of um, offseason moves, we'll talk about some of the other moves that have happened. Um, some of the lesser known moves um, around the league. Obviously, the Yankees have been in the uh, news for the past couple of days. But yesterday, the um, Houston Astros um, acquired catcher um, Victor Carantini. Um, he has been signed to the Astros this deal. Let me pull it up here for a uh, for a second. So Victor Carantini signs with the Astros. I believe this is a two year deal. Um, Carantini um, coming off back to back seasons with the um, Milwaukee Brewers. Um, his numbers weren't too bad on offense. Um, he hit two fifty nine, seven home runs, twenty five RBIs. He only played in sixty two games, so. Um, I think um, the Astros definitely need some um, need to start um, restructuring their team a little bit too. They have a lot of guys in their contract year, and um, they could use I think a little more help um, with the catching position. Um, I mean, Martin Maldonado hasn't really been the best catcher for them on offense. I think they're looking to add a little more offense in the catching position as well. Um, it's one of the lesser known moves in this off season so far, but yeah, I mean, do you have any thoughts? On- I mean, it's only, it, it, you know, it, it's it's not a it, it's not a bad move. It's not long term. Uh, I don't. I mean, look, I don't follow the Astros that much, uh, so uh, I I don't know exactly how this is going to work out. Overall, I don't know. I guess that's fine. Um, but I mean, I, I personally care the most about like the low, like Mets and Yankees, all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that signing. I think it's a good signing. Um, like it's short term, so you're not locked in. Yeah, no, I hear. Yeah, I hear you. It's not really. It's it's not really a significant move. Um, the Astros. I think the Astros are fine um, in terms of um, what they have. They, like I said, they're gonna look to. Um, I think improve that rotation a little bit um, and try and maybe get another bat or two in that lineup, especially since this is a contract year for certain guys. Um, I think this is Bregman's contract year. Um, I think this year or next year's out two base contract year, if I'm not mistaken. So they're looking to stay competitive. And um, I think this is one move that they think can uh, help benefit them to stay competitive in the American League West. Now that they have um, the defending world champion, Texas Rangers um, back to relevance this season. So we'll see. It's like I said, it's not really a, it's not really a, a newsworthy move necessarily around baseball, but it's a move nonetheless. Um, this one is a little more um, newsworthy. Um, Eduardo Rodriguez has reached a four-year, $80 million deal with the defending National League champion Arizona Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks obviously shocked the baseball world by going all the way to the World Series. Obviously, we're overmatched by the uh, Rangers. But the um, Diamondbacks, obviously, their Achilles heel this past season was their starting rotation. They didn't really have too much depth behind um, Zach Gallen, even though um, what they had was good enough to win the National League pennant. So, yeah, Eduardo Rodriguez was a big um, starting pitching free agent um, this offseason. Um, he was probably valued a little less than guys like Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery, but nonetheless, he has reached a four-year deal, $80 million deal with the Diamondbacks. Um, I think it's a 
I think it's a good move for the Diamondbacks to try and add a little more um, depth to that rotation. Rodriguez has always been a uh, solid starting pitcher. He's had his in, he's had his history with injuries, obviously too, but he did have a good year with the uh, Tigers in 2023. Um, what are your thoughts? I I think it's a, I think it's a smart move. Uh, the Diamondbacks. I mean, it, I've always remembered the Diamondbacks. They they very often throughout my life had like really bad starting rotations. Um, and yeah, that was kind of their Achilles heel last year. Um, and you know, that they were, they were very, it's strange that how good the Diamondbacks were last year. Um, it's crazy because just two years ago, they were like the laugh, them and the Orioles were like the laughing stock of baseball. Mm -hmm. Um, 80 million, I mean, 20, 20 million a year for a guy like Rodriguez is, I think it's a pretty good move. Um, they, they kind of had to do it. And they definitely needed to add some arms. They definitely needed to add another arm. Especially a lefty. Lefties tend to be more valuable. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Diamondbacks are, you know, our contenders again. And, you know, they're looking to stay relevant and competitive in the National League West. Um, I mean, obviously, the National League West is um, kind of, um, in terms of who has the best chance to win the National League West next season, obviously, the Dodgers are always the favorites. Um, the Padres obviously are coming off a disappointing 2023. Um, the Rockies are nowhere near back to being competitive and the giants, you know, you don't really know what you're going to get out of them year in and year out. They could all, they could come out of nowhere, obviously one season and then just fall back to irrelevance the next season. So, you know, it's a move. The Diamondbacks definitely needed to make some moves this off season. And I definitely, I agree with you. I think 20 million a year for four years is a pretty solid deal. And Rodriguez, like I said, is a good pitcher. So yeah, it's a good deal for the Diamondbacks. And I definitely think that you can see some signs of improvement from them next year. I think they can um, only go upward. Well, well, I guess maybe not. they're going to try and go upward. That is um, in uh, 2024. So we'll see how it goes. But I do like the deal. I think Rodriguez is a good pitcher. And I think this is a fair deal. Yeah, I mean, well, the thing is, they have to do it because they're always just in constant competition with the Dodgers, especially in being in the NL. So they they couldn't do what they I mean, they made the World Series. I mean, they're doing something right. Um, They're clearly doing something right. Maybe if they had good pitching, they could have won the World Series, better pitching. They could have won the World Series. Who knows? Um, But yeah, that that, the Dodgers are always going to be there, uh, like, you know, breathing down their necks. (laughs) Yeah. Um, I mean, speaking of the Dodgers, too, I mean, they're one of the favorites to land the um, the biggest free agent in the offseason and one of the biggest free agents of all time, Shohei Otani. Otani is expected to make his decision by the end of this weekend. The favorites probably are the Dodgers. Um, and there's also been talk about him possibly going to Toronto to play for the Blue Jays. Now, Dave Roberts a little while ago mentioned that he revealed in the press that he did meet with uh, Shohei Otani and that the meeting went very well and it was good just to get to know him a little bit. Otani stated that he prefers teams not mention that he met up with them. So Roberts completely flushed that down the toilet. Yeah, um, Roberts. And he, he can't unsay it. He can't walk it back. Yeah. I don't he know if that's. I don't know if that's going to diminish the um, chances that um, – Oh, it time. absolutely does. Oh, it does? I think it absolutely does. Imagine if like – I mean, first of all, it's essentially like a job interview, except he's interviewing them. That's basically what this is. It's a job interview, but in reverse. Um, like they're trying to impress Otani, not the other way around. Um, and Otani seems like a quiet guy. Um and given the fact that he doesn't want that being mentioned, it seems kind of like benign that he said it. But he might have screwed it all up, like single-handedly by mentioning that. I mean, I I think he very well could have. I, I think it brings it down tremendously. Um, I, yeah, I think Dave Roberts really screwed up bringing that up. If anything, he should ask him first. Would you mind if I mentioned that we met? That would have been the smart thing to do. And if not, and if you're unsure, don't say anything because it's not going to hurt you. Uh, yeah, I, I can, I, I see where you're coming from. I mean, Otani's kind of a weird dude. I mean, a, a lot of things kind of tick him off. Um, it's easy to get him aggravated. He has kind of a strange relationship with the, um, 
with the press. Um, I think more of the Japanese press more so than the American press. But um, yeah, I mean, in this case scenario, I think Roberts probably should have kept his mouth shut in regards to um, meeting with Otani because you never know um, what's going to take Otani off. And like I said, Otani's kind of, like I said, he's a weird guy. It's hard to like completely understand where he's coming from. But um, yeah, I mean, Otani obviously is is one of the greatest baseball players ever at this point coming off another MVP, coming off another MVP award winning season. Um, obviously he's not going to pitch in 2024 because of Tommy John surgery, but yeah, with, um, with his free agent set free agency status, it's basically between the Dodgers and like I said, the other team that's really been in the talks with him more recently have been the blue Jays. There's been talk that he could, that it could be um, reasonable to expect him to play in Toronto due to the fact that the press in Toronto, baseball's kind of secondary in Toronto compared to hockey. Hockey obviously dominates um, that that city and that country. <laughs> the only city that's like that. Of course, it's in Canada. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that helps um, Otani like, get a little bit of a breath of fresh air away from the spotlight, away from the press. Um, also playing in a dome, Otani apparently also doesn't like to have so many changes in climate or and temperature to um i think pitch in or hit in so i think he likes i think it. that's a common thing yeah oh well especially since he came from playing in a domed environment um in japan so um well I it, yeah i mean and by the way the weather in california in southern california is a lot more stable and tolerable than in say you know can than in new york well, yeah, obviously. And, in New um, York, it's like you go from you go through all of the extremes in a baseball season. You get sometimes it's, it could be really cold in New York, and then it could be really warm, really hot. Like it, it could be really bad. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to uh, the Blue Jays, they could use a bat like Otani. Like Otani, I mean, the Blue Jays obviously already have some pretty big threats in that lineup with Vlad Guerrero Jr., <laughs> Bo Bichette. Those two are probably the biggest threats in that lineup. Um, but you know, other than that, I mean, the Blue Jays have kind of been, Blue Jays are kind of inconsistent when it comes to their offense. There are times where their offense looks unstoppable and there are times where their offense just looks completely dormant. Like it can't wake up from a slump and, um, the Blue Jays, you know, they're also, you know, get, get kind of older. Um, I mean, they still have George Springer, but Springer's, um, I think he's entering his mid thirties now. He's not the same player that he was when he was with the Astros. Um, so bringing in Otani, I think definitely would help solidify that, um, offense a lot more and putting him in a lineup next to Guerrero and Bichette and guys like that. I definitely think that makes their lineup much more dangerous. Obviously it would be nice if he could pitch too, because that Blue Jays rotation is not strong, um, as it has been previously. Um, and that I definitely could see him going to Toronto, like I said. I mean, with the Dodgers, the Dodgers, obviously, you know, they're a juggernaut year in and year out. They have the big names like Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman. And bringing in, bring in a Shohei Otani only, you know, increases the all-star caliber of their lineup. But, you know, I mean, the Dodgers, for all, you know, for all their big names that they've had in their um, on their roster and in that lineup year in and year out, you know, they just keep coming up, coming up short in October. Um, and, you know, like I said, and like we mentioned, you know, the Dodgers, you know, they have much more press coverage than it comes to um, Anaheim and the Angels. So it's interesting. Um, I think both teams could benefit. I, I mean, any team could benefit from having Shoei Otani in their lineup. It really just depends on what Otani is most comfortable with. And, yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, the fact that he's not pitching next season definitely puts a damper on things. But. I mean, you can't deny that his um, his bat is as lethal as ever, and he has one of the sweetest swings in all of baseball. And yeah, I think I think personally, it's between the Blue Jays and the Dodgers. Uh, where do you see him um, ending up? Do you see more so the Dodgers, or do you see more so the Blue Jays? Do you have another team maybe up your sleeve that you think that you could possibly? Is there still a chance he goes to the Yankees? I doubt it. After the Yankees getting Soto, I highly doubt it. And I don't even think he would want to go to New York. I think he even stated in the um, – he even stated that he couldn't see himself playing in New York. I don't well, think he would. part of me would say, even though I think Dave Roberts really screwed up and 
even if there was a chance he goes to the Yankees, uh, I still wouldn't pick them as the as the most likely team. But I, I still think the Dodgers are the most likely, uh, mainly largely because of familiarity. Um, I think familiarity would really help. I mean, you're going from L.A. to L.A. You're Anaheim to L.A. Uh, so, I mean, I could see that being a reason why he would want to go to the Dodgers as opposed to anywhere else. Um, maybe I, I could I could see him going to the Blue Jays, but we just from for what seems like with him, it seems like they would he would more likely go to uh, go to the Dodgers there the favorite to win the national league every year. Um, he spent a lot of time losing in uh, it with the angels. And it's just sort of an upgrade. I, I mean, like you're going from Anaheim to LA, if you're comfortable, I mean, like, it, it's not like going to the other, going all the way to Toronto. Uh, it, it, I, I could still see the blue Jays getting him, but something tells me the Dodgers are going to. Um, also, the Dodgers are just more of a powerhouse team than the Blue Jays. I mean, they do have somewhat of an advantage inherently. Yeah, I can, I can, I, I definitely agree. I think there's definitely a chance that he could. Um, I mean, I still am skeptical with what his reaction was when, um, when Roberts completely disobeyed uh, his request for. Um, well, well, he didn't disobey his request. He he just it, like he didn't request that he don't say anything. I think he just. Roberts thought it would be okay, and Otani didn't like it. Oh, yeah, true. Um, um, but, yeah, I definitely – I guess when it comes to those two teams, I guess I would lean more towards um, the Dodgers as well. I mean, the only thing that's really going to change for him besides the team and the stadium is just the press coverage is definitely going to be much more um, than it was when he was with the Angels. And you got to wonder, you know, how is he going to handle that because he is kind of – like I said, he's um, an interesting individual to say the least. And, um, yeah, but I definitely think that, you know, the fans are going to gravitate towards him. He'll, he'll do, I think he'll be fine with the Dodgers. The fans are going to love him. Yeah. I mean, I will say the press coverage will be more, um, because the Dodgers are a more relevant team. They're just a better team than the angels. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know how much that involved that has to do with his decision. Um, him as an individual, is always, at least on a national level, the most relevant as a player individually, all else being equal. Um, but yeah, you're right. It would the press coverage would be a lot uh, bigger, I would say, if he was on the Dodgers. Yeah, I mean, there was also some talk that he could possibly maybe consider the Mariners, but I don't know if the Mariners were, have really been in talks with him that much. To be, honest. I have no idea. Yeah, I, I haven't heard that they were. No, neither have I. I think it's most likely going to be between the. Um, the Blue Jays are the Dodgers more so than anybody else. So I mean, yeah. this whole Dave Roberts thing, messi- screwing that up with Otani, revealing to the press that they had a meeting, which, like I said, normally is not a problem. But some people have very, like, some people just have very um, uh, introverted personalities and they don't want any of these things to get out. Um, that could really end up screwing the Yankees because, like, it, like I'm sure you're praying that he does, like obviously like Otani going to the Blue Jays would be really bad for the Yankees. Well, yeah, I mean Otani kills the Yankees. He hits a home run every single time. Yeah, now we, exactly. Now he's in your division. Yeah, he hits a home he run. Every, Blue Jays. He hits a home run every single time that he plays the Yankees. So, you know, the, the Yankees are praying that it's um the Dodgers and not the Blue Jays this season or or for the foreseeable future. But we'll see. Apparently, he's going to be making his decision at the end of this weekend. And um and yeah, we'll see how it goes. But um, but yeah, that's all the topics that we have for today's episode. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Again, um, please make sure you follow us on all of our social media platforms, Instagram, X, um, Facebook, and YouTube. Check out our podcast. And yeah, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks for having me.